My name is Mike Hideous. I'm an artist, a photographer, and an author. In 1988, I created a rock band called The Empire Hideous, and I released several albums and performed around the country. This is a variety podcast in which Professor Z and I extract details from interesting daily headlines to offer our listeners the inevitable truth. You're listening to Finding the Truth with Mike Hideous. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Finding the Truth with Mike Hideous. That would be me. Uh, today is March 11th, and um, we have a couple interesting topics for you. Um, our last episode, uh, we had reached episode 10. I'm pleased to say we did an interview with a, a friend of mine by the name of Dr. John, who was both an artist, uh, a an all, a published author and a retired orthopedic doctor. And tonight, um, my co-host and producer, Professor Z, will be uh, joining me, just him and I tonight, joining me with uh, in some conversation about um, some of the topics that we're going to bring to you. So we're, we're going to try to m break it up a little bit for you, kind of get some interesting topics that'll enlighten you and other ones that will just make you angry um <laughs> so there you go hello awesome. uh, i was gonna say president z hello professor <laughs> z <laughs> no I, I don't want that job thanks there hello lord both. hideous <laughs> you're hello hello <laughs> glad to be part of the show again and, and by the way ladies and gentlemen by the way professor z is coming to us from on location <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even going to go there. I'm just going to leave it at that. Uh, use your imagination, if you will. Yes, I, I am in a, a movable bunker someplace. Uh, yeah. <laughs> movable tank. You know. What would you like to start so with tonight, what, what we, Well, I guess, you know, one of the things that, that you and I have been talking about for, you know, oh, wow, I guess even almost close to a year, a year. Um, is that, yeah, it is the fact that uh, next month, and I do believe it's on the eighth. the eighth. Yes, is going to be an, an eclipse, and a it is solar, going to be a solar, a solar eclipse, eclipse. Yes, and one of the most important ones in decades that's going to happen because it's a really big deal. And America, just if I might just add, America is not going to have a solar eclipse like this for like another thirty years. This is a big deal. Yep. Twenty forty four. Twenty forty four will be the next one. So this is your your. Depending on your age, this is your best opportunity to get out there and see a, a full solar eclipse. If I, if I may say, everybody in America will be able to see the eclipse. However, uh, uh, if you know what, what what a totality is, the totality is where the actual um, the shadow of the moon is it, 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 that covers you. All right. So that that's the totality. So you'll be able to see it on the West Coast as well as the East Coast. But uh, and we'll I'm not going to give away what we're going to do, but I'll say those who will be in the totality area will be completely covered by the shadow of the moon in front of the sun. And um, well, do you want to tell them or shall I? The, the arc of the totality is going to be coming from uh, essentially across the United States, starting in Texas and then arcing right across the country up until, uh, I guess, New York State and maybe through Maine. new england right and maine new, yeah new england and so it's it's really going to you know literally go straight across the country almost like in the diagonal um right. and it, like you pointed out it'll be a great opportunity weather permitting depending on where you are you'll be able to get a really good view of this or you may actually see the totality which is uh, you know obviously a, and a pretty amazing thing to get to witness in person absolutely i've i've witnessed one full actual solar eclipse in 19 i think it was 90 or 91 uh, i actually witnessed it um uh unfortunately i was working at the time so i couldn't really get to view it completely but it was one of the most amazing things i had ever encountered the second one i encountered was in 2017 out here in pennsylvania but that wasn't a totality that uh i if i remember correctly 
the te- the totality was further um, westward, if I remember correctly. Either way, I only saw a portion of the of the moon cutting in front of the sun, and that was all we got here on the east coast or close to the east coast in Pennsylvania. Um, but uh, for the most part, yeah, it it was a blackout, so to speak. Uh, all the birds stopped chirping, street lights went on. Uh, it was absolutely fantastic, and from the 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 portion of shadow and shade that is uh, ref- uh how do i say it? not reflected but the impressions that you get from anything that's blocking the light for example leaves on the tree mind you this happened when i saw it i believe it happened in june of 20 i'm sorry of, of 1990 so when I looked down at the leaves that were casting shadows on the ground, everything casts a half moon. Everything. It's astonishing. If you put your hands out like this, you know, on the to, to, to cast a, a shadow on the ground, every dot of light will be a half moon. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> And and I don't know why, <laughs> but it's astonishing. It really is. You know, I was uh, in my twenties at the time. I think I was twenty. I think I was twenty three. No, wait, wait. Yeah, I was twenty three years old. Um, and uh, I was working. Um, I remember when Doc and I were talking about the places that he knew. Uh, he mentioned that place, Two Tone. Sure. I was actually working there when it happened, yeah. and I I went outside to see it because again it was a really big deal for me. But the owner didn't quite understand how much of a big deal it was for me, and made me come back inside and work. Uh, in any event, no, I didn't <laughs> photograph it. I only got to witness it. Uh, the one in 2017, I tried to photograph. I didn't have the proper tools with my professional cameras to photograph it. So what I did is I took I have um eclipse glasses so you can look at the sun Mm -hmm. and i took them and i put them over my cell phone and i used them uh, i used the glasses as a as a shield if you will to see the portion of the moon cutting in front of the sun and it only got a little bit dark it didn't get didn't get really dark like a totality so right but this one's going to be major, major, major. This is a really big deal for those of you who are fascinated by celestial uh, events like this, as as I am. Right. Yeah, definitely. And I'm I'm fascinated by it as well. I so mean, should we tell them? I think we should. Uh, you know. So what Professor Z and I are going to do is we are going to drive west to get to the complete totality. Because even though I'm in Pennsylvania on the east coast of Pennsylvania, we are not going to get the totality. But on the west coast, it's literally going to pass right towards the edge of, what is that, Ohio, um, Pennsylvania, and Mm -hmm. New York State as it goes up in that direction. So we're going to drive out in that uh, westward, basically, uh, depending on the weather, and clouds. Yeah, we're going to. We're trying west. to find the the right location, you know. And now that we're right. we're less than a month away, it should be a little bit easier to pinpoint where we want to try and be. Mm. But that could change at any day, you know, yeah. like closer to the event. You never know. So we're hoping for a nice clear day that we can see this amazing event take place. I'm very excited, and I plan on taking photographs. Uh, Z is going to video record it. Um, I, I plan on using several of my cameras to get different variations of, of the sun from, from close ups of, of the moon covering the sun where you might, if we're lucky based on the, the camera, we might actually be able to get, uh, images of, uh, what do they call them? Uh, uh not a, not a flare when, when those the solar flares. magnetic oh yeah solar flares storms right when the, right, right? Yeah. when the when the when the, when the giant things of 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 mag or not magma but sun Plasma, stuff basically <laughs> sun loops stuff. up 
Yes. Right. It, it yes. Loops it, when up when the sun itself. expels, basically, you know the the. Okay, now I'm losing my terminology, but it's radiation. Sun it's stuff. cosmic rays. It's sun stuff. Yes. So um, when I used to uh, volunteer, um, uh, I used to volunteer at two different uh, observatories. The first one I used to volunteer was at, at uh, was in Lynnhurst, New Jersey, at a place called the um, the McDowell the McDowell Observatory in Lynnhurst in the Meadowlands. And I was there for quite a while. They had a great telescope, like a $150,000 telescope that was arranged by one of some NASA guy. Then I went to Bergen County College where I, um, I actually followed uh, the woman who used to work at the Lynnhurst Observatory. She left there and went to Bergen County uh, College Observatory where they had a lesser telescope. Anyway, I followed her. That was, uh, her name was Laura. Oh crap. I can't remember. Laura something. She was a, what they called a, a NASA ambassador. She taught me how to operate the $150,000 telescope. And I used to take pictures through that telescope onto the camera I had. Now, what I'm getting at is this, since we were talking about sun stuff, when I went to Bergen County, sorry, Bergen Community College Observatory, on one particular event uh, or occasion, they did a, a daytime uh, observatory with one of the telescopes that they had pointing at the sun. And I hooked up my camera to it, and I've got pictures, again, sun stuff, whatever it's a flare. I'm not sure what they're called. It's a solar flare. Called. I guess we solar just go flare. with that. Yeah. Right. So I've got a picture of the sun and one of those flares exploding. That flare Amazing. was probably 10 times larger than the earth. Right. Definitely. That's amazing. I also have pictures of the sun with sunspots on it. Very cool. Yeah. I, I was really impressed that by must... those pictures. I hate to I hate to brag, but. And since you, you had some experience, at least, you know, using a camera with a, a telescope, um, what are the things to be concerned about with photographing, uh, you know, a solar event or, or at least, a, you know, the totality of a solar eclipse? Well, the first thing would be looking directly at the sun and going blind. That would be the oh, first. Oh, you want to do that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, listeners, actually, do not do that. <laughs> no, don't do it. It's very bad for your eyes. You'll go blind. You will, you'll damage your retina. There are plenty of things that you might be able to get online right now. You know, the, the eclipse glasses that are, that'll protect your eyes. Um, I recently bought uh, the film that I'm going to use that goes over my camera lenses um, that you use prior to the actual totality, which is when this, the moon completely covers the sun prior to that moment. Everybody who's going to be photographing it, video, videoing it, or video recording it, um, or even looking at it, you have to use the film either through the glasses or the film that they sell for camera lenses. Um, then once the totality takes place, um, for example, me being a photographer, I would take... I would take the, the film off the lens in order to photograph the actual totality with the sun and the corona illuminating around the sun and moon. That's what I'm going to try to get with my 400 millimeter lens. With my 600 millimeter lens, I'm going to try to zoom in as possible, as close as possible to get whatever I possibly can at the edges of, of the sun and moon as well as you know, pulling back a bit and getting that real close-up of that ring. The 400 millimeter, again, as I said, will be for the, getting the corona. And then I do have another, uh, another lens that I'll probably try to get the actual scenery of wherever we're going to be with the sun in the sky, depending on how high it is in the sky. Because from where we're going to be, it's going to take place somewhere between 3 o'clock and 3.15. So that's our window, depending on where we are when we drive west. 
Um, so again, based on the last minute plans on where uh, bad weather may be or good weather may be, hope, hopefully good weather, is going to be where uh, you and I will be driving to. So uh, I think I uh, did. I miss anything? Uh, did I? No, did no. I your no actually, I have a question. Sort of. Actually, I want to get back to uh, you know just something more specific for our listeners. So obviously, you need to use this film on your lenses, and obviously, I mean, it goes without saying almost. Well, you'd hope so. That you know, with the naked human eye, you should never look stare you know right into the sun, and you shouldn't watch an eclipse. So, but, That's right. um, and so obviously you need to wear glasses, but what, what are, is, is the dangers literally that you could, you know, destroy your camera if you try to take a picture of the sun without the filter? Now that's a good question. From what I understand, technically speaking, I don't think you can ruin your camera. I've heard different stories about the sensors getting burned out if it's pointed directly at the sun, uh, and I got to tell you, I don't even know if that's a matter of taking the picture or just looking at the sun uh, okay. you know, through the lens. Uh, I can't provide a, a proper answer for that because I'm not exactly okay. sure. You, you could probably look it it's up just, online. That's what's recommended uh, essentially know, amongst photographers. Right. Yeah. It, they, 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 they recommend that you use the film that they sell, which, by the way, is $15. No, wait. Yeah. No, $30 a sheet, $30 a sheet for a piece of film. <laughs> I spent $60 <laughs> on two of them. I yeah. was, it must have wow. cost them like 10 cents to make it. Um, anyway, so yeah, I'm going to, I got the film uh, and, and then I'm going to probably in the next week or so, I'm going to um, uh, create a, a little device using foam core that'll go around the lens itself on the outside and then the film would cover the lens and then it'll right. be able to flip up and flip down and that will help me to look directly at the sun with the with the film down look directly at the sun when the totality happens you flip it up and you can see the actual eclipse taking place when the when the sun is completely covered by the disk of the moon right so i guess i, I know you don't necessarily like you said using the film you know most likely sort of protects your camera from being you know obviously you know blinded by the sun but i would guess that you know the yeah. film uh, covering the lens also helps reduce i guess the f-stop or at least did bring it it's sort of like a neutral density uh, filter is it give that sort of effect so that it's easier to shoot something so bright well yeah once you have that film yeah once you have that f once you have that film over the lens it's very dark uh so if you don't if you're not looking at the sun you're not going to see anything it's like wearing a welder's mask you only right. see okay. bright light like you pointed out, I'm going to be doing some video so I can hopefully capture some motion and uh, the, of the entire event and so forth. And, um, you know, it's actually part of my research, just to be quite honest, Mike has done his on, on photography, but I still need to read up on exactly what videographers do uh, when they try to capture this sort of event. And uh, so honestly, listeners, if anybody has any input, please feel free to leave a comment so that we can uh, have some insight. But uh, I'll have to do some research and, and, you know, figure out what I can, you know, what I need to do necessarily to make sure I can capture it's, it's the event generally, as well. It's generally the same as a, a photography camera. That's it. That's all you need is, is to have that film over the lens during uh, the portions of the eclipse before it's a totality. Once it's totality, you take it off, click, click, click you know, or in your case, hit the record button. <laughs> just just keep um, recording. And you just, yeah. And that's going to just happen. For, I think they said it's going to happen for about four minutes. We'll have totality for about four minutes. Okay. And, uh, which is a big deal. I think this is a long one. I think this is a long one. Uh, sometimes they're a little shorter. Mm -hmm. um, but I think this is going to be a little bit longer. I think it all depends on the position of the, you know, the moon and the rotation of the earth and how it all works together. It's all geometry, you know? 
right um, in any event um so yeah now the other thing we've been considering is whether or not uh i don't even know if this is going to be possible if we can do it live while we're there i'm sure it is possible we just might not have the equipment yet but we want to try it live to stream the, the show while we're there if that doesn't work out then we're just simply going to uh do the show at, you know when we can and we'll yep. um use the imagery that we both recorded video wise and uh i photograph and we'll we'll post those images on the show for everyone to see so that would obviously the eclipse is on a- a- april 8th which i believe mm-hmm. is a monday monday yep. a monday and um so if we don't do the show that day live we will pick another day to um well that's usually the day we record yeah um, so and then so uh, we may actually you know be able to put together a show and at least you know we'll have it hopefully ready for our, our uh, audience you know by the end of the week at the very least right right so uh yeah that's that um uh, again i'm that's super our- super excited about this this is a really big deal for me uh, a once in a lifetime opportunity for anybody who has never seen an eclipse if you see a totality it will in my opinion it will blow your mind it blew mine every time i've seen them and this is going to be my first totality true totality yeah it's a it's a you know uh eclipses take place like every almost every other day sometimes in the world well um they do happen regularly it's just not in our do. corner of the world uh but we haven't had a good one i mean we had that one in 20 2017 and then before that in uh, 1990 90 or 91 uh but since then we haven't had a real real good one and a lot of times since we have more water than we have land on the planet, a lot of times they just go right over the ocean. You don't even realize it or sure. know what's happening. Uh, yeah. Did you have you ever seen the footage of a, a solar eclipse viewed from an airplane? I think I have. You know, in in my browsing of YouTube, I may have seen that at mm. least once. But so I, I don't I, think the plane was it. in the totality. I think it was more, you know, obviously next to the totality. But, um, yeah, what well, did you one, get to see? The one I saw. Sorry, I'm drinking wine and I'm belching all the all the while I'm drinking and talking here. Um, <laughs> so the one I saw, they're up, they're in a jet. And it, it, it's, it's just, it's a commercial jet. And they're flying. And they're looking, you know, people are looking out the window. And, and you know, you're. You're above the clouds. Now, mind you, we're, we're, we're small compared to the planet and the moon and the sun. So Very as small. they're flying, okay, you can see the darkness coming across the clouds as it gets closer and closer to the plane. And then everything just goes dark. Wow. It, it was really amazing. Like literally the the sh- the the shadow of the of the moon came across the top part of the clouds and eventually it got closer and closer to the guy video recording right in the plane and then it come boom 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 and then it's just like dark and that that was just really amazing. That was that was really cool. You know, I, I could say it, it must be some something of a humbling experience because like you're saying, you know, we are very small essentially in the universe as, as human beings. But, you know, to see literally cosmic forces type of thing in action and like it's just, you know, the, the miracle of our universe and, and the way it functions and so forth. And mm-hmm. it's just certainly going to be a, a very exciting time to, to see something that is so unique. Yeah. And and, you know, uh when I say we are small and the planets are big and space is infinite, Vast. I mean, we true, we truly are this micro dot of existing species. We truly mean nothing. And, 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 you know, maybe somebody out there can say, well, you know, God, 
and uh, you know God made it all okay whatever so um, whether he made it all or not the point of the matter is we are nothing and that's the humbling thing because when you look all right for example the James Webb telescope when you look at when you look at the things that the James Webb is currently recording out in space in deep space and mind you this is this this telescope is as big as a tennis court it's got like I think I think 32 mirrors that reflect gold plated mirrors yeah and they're amazing they are and it has the images that it has provided for scientists as opposed to the Hubble which did a great job but this is a bigger bigger telescope and when you see the more resolution like, right <laughs> right and more megapixels see, like, when you see a nebula a star nebula a planetary nebula when you see a supernova uh, or or i should say the remnants of a supernova when you see and and i don't know if you know this did you ever see the images of the black hole the pictures that they took at oh the yeah center? from the web telescope yeah Yes. No, actually, yep. no, that was before the Webb telescope. They did well, they now have um, a better picture of it, but I mean, still, I know. Right. What they did been, is they, okay. they connected all these telescopes around the Earth, and they all pointed at one direction in our into our universe. Uh, I'm sorry, in our galaxy. And that's how they got that picture, the first picture of the black hole. Because that okay. was taken around 2016, 17, maybe 18. The James Webb wasn't launched until what twenty one? I think it was twenty twenty two. Yeah, or twenty two. Like so, that. my point is this: so all these things that are, again, a, like a black hole, we have images of a black hole. This this is this is like super historic imagery. This is beyond, this proves Einstein, 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 Einstein. It proves his theory yes, Einstein. of black holes. Uh, we knew they existed. We just can't see them because they're invisible. But we have the imagery. Mm -hmm. Did you ever see the images of the stars yeah. whipping around it at like, like yes. unbelievable miles per hour? Like, well, around we can't even fathom it. Hole. Yeah, it's it's beyond yeah. our comprehension. But yeah, so I mean, when I mean, you when you have something so, so small, we're so small and mm -hmm. insignificant. We mean nothing. And when we're gone, it ain't going to make any difference because the Earth is going to shake us off like a, a bad case of fleas, and we will be history, just like every mm -hmm. culture, every species that has died before us. And there's been five major extinctions prior to where humanity is right now in, in this part, of, uh, this era of time. And eventually we're going to be gone. That's why it always cracks me up when I hear about humans talking about, well, you know, we got to save humanity, so we should fly to Mars and start a colony there. It ain't going to make a difference. When it's time, we're done, period. Well, still, I mean, even anybody could get off planet to try and live anywhere is, is pretty much a stretch of imagination as it is. Even I mean, if they you know, did, I'm, I'm, they can only go in this solar system. It's impossible yeah. to travel at light speed to another galaxy or another solar system. It's just impossible. Mm -hmm. We just so don't have the technology. One, what? We don't have the technology. And we never will because humanity, no. humans cannot travel at the speed of light. It's just simply physically not possible. And so, that goes back to Einstein's theory, essentially. And just to explain better, that is part of the E equals MC squared scenario. Essentially, his theory was that the faster we go, get to the speed of light, we will become energy. And, and that's where we will not last, you know, that transition. So until yeah. technology gets to the point to, one, actually have a device go at the speed of light, and two, actually be able to protect it itself as well as its inhabitant, inhabitants, you know, it's very unlikely that we were ever going to do interstellar travel. Although I am a big fan of Star Trek, and it'd be great to have him, but <laughs> it ain't going to probably it's happen. You It'll know. never happen. That's why when, when they talk about humanity uh, saving the species, you know, because Earth is too polluted. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of pollution here, but again, Earth will take care of itself. And 
if anything goes, it'll be the people. So uh, again, what I'm trying to say is that um, no matter how much we say we want to save the species, we can only, even if we do go to Mars, I mean, let's, just say, like, let's just say for, for the benefit of the doubt, we invent some way to get a colony to Mars and we start humanity on Mars, terraforming and everything. And we start a new colony on Mars. Okay, so let's just say that happens. And let's say that colony lasts, I'm going to throw a number out there, 200 years. Okay, 200 years. And then, I don't know, a meteor hits, boom, everything is gone. Or let's just say we do last, oh, I don't know, 10,000 years. Okay, humanity lasts 10,000 years. It's not going to make a difference because eventually when the sun begins to expand more and more and more as it begins to die, I'm, and I'm talking like billions of years from now. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if humanity lasts another 10,000 years, that would be fantastic. But we're still it not would. going to last to the point of actually seeing the sun go nova. No, um, never. It's, so it's, that's it's, my it's, point. It's just... Even if we, we, we did get to another planet and we 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 did good and, and things are going well, the sun's going to die. Everything ends. Everything dies. So no matter how much they talk about saving humanity or the species, it's not going to matter. It really isn't mm -hmm. because when the time comes, we're gone. And whether it's by meteor, asteroid, comet hitting the Earth or Mars for that matter – or the sun just getting hotter mm -hmm. and blowing it up and melting the earth. We're not go. going to survive. It's just the well, way it is. J J you're, you're absolutely correct. You know, someday there's going to be an event and there's nothing that we're going to be able to do about it. And that's where, honestly, you know, it's great that we have scientists that are researching it and looking into it. But uh, getting back to something, you know, obviously we've been talking in a number of our shows, you know, humanity is going to have to sort of worry about saving itself right now. Um, because also to your point, like I've often described the earth, you know, people on earth are more or less like fleas on the back of a really, really large animal. So yes, the, the, the planet could shake us off like a bad case of fleas. And, but you know, it, before any of that ever happens, we still have to try and save ourselves. I mean, because we're certainly at a point in our society, in our history, where we are more or less at each other's throats. And if somehow we can't somehow come to compromises and start appreciating, appreciating one another, as well as just loving one another, it's not going to go very well. Never happened. Well, you're humanity, not wrong. I mean, humanity is a violent animal. And they it, are. We, we, especially like if you, if you really think about let, let's go back 10,000 years of humanity when there were tribes and groups of humans, okay? And those humans evolved in uh, Middle East, Africa, even uh, por portions of the Americas before, um, I mean, they haven't really, they've only discovered so much about the Americas. A lot of uh, people, scientists believe that, you know, humanity really started in the Middle East and Africa. Um, yeah, so that's where they I'm found Lucy. Is you've got, huh? Lucy. That's where right? they found Lucy. Yes, right. So, and for anybody who doesn't know what that means, uh, we're talking about the uh, the corpse that they found uh, that was like how old? Ten thousand, twenty thousand years old? Something like that. Yeah, but it seems to be the earliest progenitor to the current, you know, Homo sapiens. Right, well, don't throw me off. Hang on. What I'm trying to say sure, is good. that, um, um, I forgot. And I threw you off. <laughs> uh, what the hell was I saying? Uh, oh, Go so back 10,000 10, years 10, when there was years. tribes and there was people. <clears throat> so you got yeah. groups of people, groups of humans that congregate and reproduce with their own kind. That's how you have Asians, Caucasians, uh, Nordic, Black, uh, Arabic, the Indians, the northern, like the Eskimos, uh, and that, you know, like you had different species of humans. Now, as time went by, through the Greeks and the Romans, 
we we discovered a new thing called creating societies and civilization building houses and homes and 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 trading with other cultures that we might have met so in other words the romans were trading with the uh the africans for lack of a better term so that's how things worked now we're in a point in time where you know everything's mixed for the most part especially in america everything's mixed it's the melting pot so you have all different cultures in america but what i'm getting at is there was a point in time again 10,000 years ago where tribes fought each other and if they didn't perfect example the american indians there were the cherokees the uh the mohawks um uh the uh um i can't remember apaches the apaches now they were bad too they were nasty yeah. they were mean right and what they would do is they would fight each other their tribes would fight each other and you know they would do horrific things. And I'm not saying it's just the Indians. Every culture on earth yeah. has done horrific things to either other cultures or even their own. Like uh, yeah. whether it was because they punished somebody for look at the Look at the Mayans. They used to do, you know, straight out human sacrifice. Of course. So, you know, people, cut your people heart were just picked out. You, alive. And, you know, we are... Uh, uh, animal with uh, a brain you know we are an animal with a sentient brain and um you know violent animal it, yeah and and that's where our intellect tends to overcome that you know because m- many people can talk their way through a disagreement and they don't have to necessarily go kill one another but uh, getting back to i guess the, sort of the idea since we're, we're getting into civilizations and so forth um, from a globalist perspective it is literally just a utopian idea to think that there can be one world government where all the peoples of the earth can get together and be happy with one another. And there won't be any racism and there won't be any hatred. Like, seriously, guys, How you know, what type of peyote politics? are you smoking? Yeah. But I mean, still, it's just it's not a reality that's going to happen because people will always have problems with the folks next door. When people would move to a neighborhood, if you were Italian, you moved to the Italian section. If you were Puerto Rican, you moved to the Puerto Rican section. If you were black, you moved to the black section. That's just the way it is. But that's neither here nor there. All I'm trying to say is that humanity itself is a violent species of of animal. And that's what we are, an animal. And it'll always be like that. Always. It will never change. As much as we think we can change it and live together in harmony, we can't. We cannot. There will always be war. There will always be racism. There will always be prejudice and bigotry, as well as violence like murder, rape, and so forth. And it's it it hates it pains me to say that, but that is the truth of it all. You're right, and that's where honestly I still kind of look at humanity as uh, you know, if you look at the the lifespan of a human, the human race as as a whole is still sort of adolescence. We haven't grown up. We don't know how to use our brains. We don't know how best to get along with one another. And and that is the honestly the difference between the animals and the sentience that we we have is that we can think and use our minds to get around just the emotional responses to whatever it might be. And and it's just gonna be I don't know how long it will take a, a larger percentage of humanity to become <laughs> more aware of how not to have hatred and and despise the next next door neighbor but maybe somehow get along with them and allow them their space and you have your space well that being said um i'd like to just kind of end this conversation and bring it into a next topic before we even get into it we'll take a hard break but um you bring up the fact about how you know humanity would you know always wants to come together the people who dream about it being a utopia or a a, a nice place where everybody can be in harmony it's just never going to happen folks never ever especially because there's eight billion people on the on the planet and it's getting more and more crowded and when it's crowded people they want elbow room and they're gonna kick and punch and scratch and gouge and bite and kill in order to get it that being said 
some people would say, well, you know, God and religion and whatever religion you're into, I should say, God is going to be the one that says, all right, everybody love each other. It's just not going to happen. So here's an interesting thing. Be- yeah. So it's just never going to happen. That Humanity is a violent creature. Having said that, before we get into our, our next topic, we will take a hard break. We're going to talk about something that took place with a kid who was a Christian and how he got arrested for preaching his word. And on that note, let's take a hard break. Warning. If you find the content of this program to be offensive, the speakers will not be held responsible if you decide to throw yourself into an active volcano. Hey folks, thanks for listening to Finding the Truth with Mike Hideous. Listen, don't forget to check out all my Hideous merchandise, including t-shirts, blankets, hoodies, CDs, and my book, King of an Empire to the Shoes of a Misfit. It's all available only at MikeHideous.com. And don't forget, that's Mike with a Y, M-Y-K-E, MikeHideous.com. To finding the truth with Mike Hideous. I am your host, Mike Hideous, and my producer and co-host, Professor Z. Say hello, Professor. Hello, Professor. <laughs> so uh, before we were talking about in the first segment, we were talking. I ended off with a uh, uh, telling you about a topic that we're going to talk about now. Now, those of you who know me know that I'm not a religious person. Nevertheless, nevertheless. Being the American that I am, I sincerely and 100% believe in the freedom of religion. What is that, the Fourth Amendment? Well, actually, I think it technically comes under the freedom of speech. I mean, I think it, I'd have to look it up real quickly, but it's the freedom Does it? to, you know, to, to, to um, gather and, you know, I'm sorry, I guess. Let me look it up. You continue talking. <laughs> All right. So anyway, I, I always thought it was one of the uh, free, uh, one of the amendments, but that's fine. Whatever. The case of the matter is, so again, I'm not a religious person, but I support the freedom in this country, the freedom to believe in your own God and follow and worship whatever religion you tend to believe in. It's that that's just the way it is in America. Exactly. And just to, to I did get the information here. It is the First Amendment. Amendment. Uh, Congress shall make no law respecting or, and establishing of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or so abridging the freedom of speech so first or amendment the press freedom of speech press freedom of religion. religion yep and the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to right. petition the government peaceably. for yes and to petition the government for red red risks or grievances Right. So that that's the one thing protesters don't understand these days, these younger protesters, because they think they know the fucking law so much, but they don't. 
and then they go out and protest by breaking windows and hitting people and causing all chaos and thinking that they're right. I have the right to protest. You do, but peacefully, not hurting other people or destroying property. That being well, said, that being I said, I have to say, I don't know if it's so much a matter of ignorance or they just don't care. They just they want to go out there because and they and only have their havoc. own way of thinking. That's why. Mm-hmm. So. Once again, uh, so this this kid who is a Christian, believes in God, and that's fine, whatever he's into, you know, um, whatever you believe in, that's fine. So uh, this kid got arrested, a 17-year-old, police arrested him for reading the Bible in public to those who would listen during a pride event in Watertown, Wisconsin. The guy's name, kid's name is Marcus Schroeder. And uh, basically he had a, a microphone with a small amp, a very small amp PA. <clears throat> and apparently you can't go and disrupt a pride parade, a pride, I'm sorry, a pride um a pride event by okay. preaching about God. So this kid who was on the sidewalk away from these people, the 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 pride people complained, police came over, no warning. They charged him with amplification without a permit. So in other words, by using the microphone with the small speaker, how much could that how much can that thing crank out it's like using a a bullhorn well when a parade's um, going by it's not gonna be that loud whatever the case i mean the still the the fact that the kid got arrested is absolutely beyond me this brings me to um other incidences in which for example i believe it was in england yes in england they had a a parade a parade i keep saying a protest against israel pro-Gaza, thousands of people were out there, primarily those who were Palestinian, cornered a guy in in the doorway, I believe, of his store or, or bar or saloon, whatever it was, cornered him because he had the English, what do they call it, the, the, uh, the British flag, the, 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 the Jack? Yeah, the Union Jack. Union, Union Jack. Jack. So he's got the the British Union Jack flag, which is their flag, England's flag. He's got that. And all these police, these bobbies, had to surround him because the Palestinian people who were protesting against Israel in England didn't want him holding his country's flag. This is what pisses me off about these people. They protest... For something happening in another country, mind you, these are people who defected or left these countries because they were under tyranny or uh, uh, wanted to get away from persecution for whatever reason. They come to a different country, such as free countries like America, England, uh, other European countries. They then bring the values that they escaped their country for and now they're bringing those va- those values to the country that has allowed them to protest. Right. But I'm getting off subject. This kid gets well, arrested for preaching about God at a pride parade. I have seen um, I have hang on, I've seen okay. religious people uh let, let me rephrase it. I've seen people who are mm, I guess protesting for a man is a man, a woman is a woman, don't kill babies, whatever the thing, you know, anti-abortion. And then I see, you know, if they're out there either hanging out on a corner, holding up a sign, don't kill babies, you know, stop abortion or believe in Jesus Christ or I don't know, whatever, believe these people who are primarily conservative. Then I see the uh, the opposition the woke the gay people who come in 
they march right through them, tearing their signs away from them, spitting at them, throwing bottles at them, spray painting their, their signs, uh, breaking their signs, setting their signs on fire, and, and attacking these people. And yet, nothing is done by the authorities to protect the, these people who are, pro, are protesting their values. Again, I am not a religious person. I also believe in abortion, but I don't think it's right for anybody else to step up and say, oh, you're Christian? Oh, well, we're going we're gonna, to you know, uh, uh, take your, your signs and your, your banners and, and you can't protest here because you're making me feel uncomfortable. <gasps> Like what? What is wrong with people? They don't understand the the process of 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 protesting. They just think that they have the right, and you don't. And I don't believe that one bit. I support this kid. He's a Christian. Yes, I'm not. I'm a Satanist. He's a Christian. I support him for for standing so, up. I agree. I mean, at the very least, I agree on the perspective that uh, you know reading the Bible in public. Uh, there, there's been a number of stories in the last couple of years, especially since the you know, administration change, where there seems to be you know, some targeting of individuals that are, you know, against, you know, say abortion. And they're, you know, out on the street and they're reading <laughs> cheers and they're they're reading the Bible and they get arrested and so forth. Um, but honestly, when it comes to this case, Mike, I'm going to have to uh, point out a little bit of the truth here. I happen to look up this guy. And uh, as you said, it was in Wisconsin, Marcus Schroeder. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. the way the story is reading on their Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, uh, it says a 19-year-old street preacher who organized Warriors for Christ training sessions teaching young people how to speak out against homosexuality is facing a felony charge. Court records show here is the charge. This, it wasn't about the Bible. Marcus Schroeder, member of the anti-abortion, anti-homosexual Christian extremist group Operation Save America, is charged with causing a bomb scare at the Watertown Pride in a park event in July. That kid. Oh, According to I the criminal corrected. complaint. He's an asshole. <laughs> yeah. <there you> go. <laughs> According to the corrected. criminal complaint. There you, according to the criminal complaint obtained by uh, the WKON, uh, NKOW 27 News, Schroeder called uh, 911 at 1157 a.m. on July 29th to report that an unknown person told him there was a bomb set to go off in the park at 1205. He called 911 at 1203 and asked if anyone anything would be done to prevent the bomb, saying he was concerned for his fellow group members. The complaint doesn't give the exact reason why the bomb threat was not found to be credible. Schroeder didn't leave the event after he made the calls, the criminal complaint says. Schroeder was arrested later that day while protesting the event for playing amplified music without a permit after he blasted music and preaching through loudspeakers. He was released without charges. His arrest garnered national attention after it was gained traction on social media, leading to interviews with Fox News and the president of the conservative lobbying organization, Family Research Council. So, okay. I mean, he's, he's scheduled to go in. He's on. He's being charged uh, with a class one felony, and he is going to maybe be fined up to ten thousand um, dollars. Okay. He's free on five thousand dollars bail. But this was back in uh, September of last year. At least that's the article date. So, yeah, I mean, the guy, you know, he definitely has the right to pray in public, but he does not have the right to be an asshole. No. So, <laughs> uh, so let me. All right. So based on everything I just said, I now retract my supporting of Marcus Schroeder, because obviously he's if he's doing stuff like calling in bomb threats, that's just wrong. However, let me say this. Forget Mark Schroeder. Let's say anybody who is out um, expressing your opinion, expressing their, their cause and their emotion about what they believe in. So that's what I'm trying to say. I did not understand, or I'm sorry. I did not realize that Marcus was um, touched in the head. What I'm trying to say is that anybody, again, erase Marcus Schroeder's name from the entire article i just read about okay i i the the story i told you about and insert any name who would do the same thing uh who isn't calling in bomb threats (laughs) 
Yeah, who isn't a little bit, you know, snapped. I mean, but, you know, it, going back to my so, other point, like if you're if you're out in, you know, across the street from an abortion clinic and you're reading the Bible out loud and to, to, to whoever walks by, that's not something that you should be arrested for. Of course not. I mean, but it's happened. Know, but uh, it's happened. Yes, and that's that is happened. And that's where, unfortunately, I guess social media took off with this. And that's maybe how you learned about it. But there's another there's another incident. There's another incident with a guy who was doing a very similar situation. Uh, again, a pride um, rally, if you will, in front of a, a I think it was in front of a church. And the and the and the clergyman, minister, clergy, priest, I don't even know. He was in support. They got the right from the church. But the people who were standing across the street were, whether they were Christian, Protestant, I don't know. But they were in support in their beliefs that they don't believe in homosexuality or all this woke gay stuff that they're pushing on everybody. Uh, Again, let me reiterate, I am not anti-homosexual. I've known gay people all my life. I currently know gay people now. I never once have ever said I am against homosexuals. I am against what they are pushing down our throat these days, the, especially the fact of giving kids hormones and and young young adults uh, sex. Uh, what are they called? Sexual uh, sexual re- uh, sex assignment surgery. Se- re- sexual reassignment surgery. I'm against that. You want to have you want to get your dick chopped off or your tits lopped off. Wait until you're 21, and then you can ruin your life, okay? But before then, you are under the protection of your parents. And if your parents are too fucking stupid to protect you and give you... Look, I was 21 too, and you couldn't tell me a goddamn thing. But my parents, if I went out of line, my father smacked me. And you know what? I never, ever held that against him. Never once did I ever say, go run into the place. Oh, my parents abused me. I got smacked. Oh, poor me. No, I got fucking hit. My father hit me with a chair one time. One time, My mother hit me with a frying pan one time. Point is, uh, what I'm Damn, trying to say. Okay. What the hell hey, did you do? Hey, <laughs> it worked. It worked. It made me never do You never did it again, again, whatever it was. That's right. That's right. Right. So, uh. Capital punishment works. No, wait, that that's not capital punishment. Um, no, no, <laughs> well, capital punishment. It does work. It's a rather permanent solution. You're gonna <laughs> capital punishment against kids who do things wrong. <laughs> yeah. No, that's uh, no. That? It's uh, it's definitely a corporal punishment. Corporal um, punishment. Right. And, right. All I'm trying to say is that um, I was I was hit as a kid. I wasn't beat. I was hit. Get my hair pulled. Get my ear pulled. Smack on the ass. Discipline. As I got older, 16, then I got a smack across the face if I did something wrong. Or, you know, a good yank on my hair. By the time I was 18 and 19, I'll never forget this day, my my mother and father were screaming at me for coming home late one day. I don't know what it was. They're like, "Ah, ah, 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 ah." now I'm 18. I'm a man at that point. I'm a grown man. And my mother smacked me across the face, something fierce. And my dad was standing right there, my good old pop. And I stood there and I, I just clenched my fish. I didn't clench it up at her like this. I had it down at my side and I clenched it. Like when she hit me, I got mad. Like my eyes, like I was like, Ugh. and my father walked up and he said, don't even think about it. <laughs> <laughs> and of course I didn't. I wasn't going to knock my mother out because my father would have beat the living hell out of me. All I'm saying is that today it's, oh, you know, honey, uh, oh, honey, don't smear shit on the wall. You know, when a little baby, an infant, oh, don't smear shit on the floor, on the wall. That's not good. No, they let the kid do it. Oh, well, he's expressing his artistic views with shit on the wall. So getting back to the whole pride thing that I was talking about, I saw parents, a mother who brought her three month old child to a pride event. And she starts telling everyone that her three month year old child was demonstrating um, acts of being 
the opposite sex. Come on. That Are sounds delusional to me. That <laughs> Whose fault is that? It's not the child. Because when I was a kid, I'll never forget this. I think I was about eight. My, I, my parents, we were in my house in Patterson. My parents were sitting at the table. They had company over. They said to me, I'm sitting on the floor playing my blocks and my Legos and army men and I'm killing things. Lincoln logs. Yes. I'm killing the Lincoln logs. And, uh, (laughs) (laughs) my mother says to me, no, no, I'm sorry. My, my mother's friend asks me, Michael, what do you want to be when you grow up? Do you know what I said to my mother's friend? I said, I want to be Uh-oh. A black female basketball player. <laughs> really? I wanted to be a female black basketball player at eight years old. That's what I wanted to be. Now, 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 think about this. Had my mother been insane and my father been insane, they would have said, well, we're going to support your theory and you can get a skin uh, transplant and become black yeah. and then you can get your penis lopped off and have a hole put there and you could be a female and then we'll teach you how to play basketball not necessarily in those no. not in that order <laughs> but that just goes to show you the insanity of people today with their kids saying my three month old child is demonstrating qualities of the opposite sex I'm sorry that doesn't happen and it is your responsibility you need to see a psychologist they need to see a psychologist yeah Yeah. exactly they need to get to a a doctor they need to understand that what they're doing to their child in my opinion and i'm sure many other people is child abuse a kid at three months a child a baby at three months old does not that that is a baby no right does not know anything Anything. They're stupid. Kids are stupid. Let's face it. That's why they go to fucking school to learn. And now you got people in school who are teaching them just as much garbage as, as the entire woke movement. Back to what you're saying with, with getting disciplined as, as a child. I still vividly remember uh, going to um, public schools where the principal basically would tell people, I'll tell all the students, I have a paddle. So if you start, you know, anything up, you're going to come to my office and he was going to beat your butt. And yep. he did that. I remember I had the same thing in my, in my grammar school. And nowadays, I mean, you know, any principal that did that, they'd be arrested and they'd probably serve time. Mm-hmm. And it's just it's ridiculous because, I mean, if you had discipline in schools, I'm sure then maybe students would be, you know, a little bit more focused on why they're there rather than being, you know, juvenile delinquents. But also <laughs> to your point, Mike, I want to bring this up. Um, there is actually a story that's, uh, that was posted on uh, Fox News uh, today, and it's talking about the fact that Maine, here I'll just read the first paragraph, a group of Republican attorney generals are sending a warning shot to the state of Maine for a bill under consideration that would effectively establish Maine as a sanctuary state for procedures like sex change surgeries for minors. And, and Maine is actually considering this bill that will allow uh, for people to come to their state, get sex change operations, and they don't have to inform their parents. That's great. That's just more than appalling that, you know, somehow a child could actually make the determination on their own or between their peers or however they want to come to the determination that I need to have a sex change operation. And then they could run away from their parents and go to Maine and have it done. Most people, even when they get to the age of 25, are still relatively stupid and can't make good decisions for themselves. I didn't know who I was until I was 25. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Listen, man, I'm at the point where I don't give a fuck anymore. I don't care. Let these people do what they want. Because I can tell you down the road, you're going to have a huge majority of kids going to psychiatrists and being on medication. And as well as a high majority of suicide, which is a fact. I'm not making that up. The, nope. the rate of suicide of younger adults, I'm not going to say kids, but it's going to happen. Uh, younger adults who get, who, get trans, who get transformed into a man or a woman from the opposite sex, their suicide rate is much higher than a normal suicide rate of, say, a heterosexual person. 
And that sure. 99% of the time is because after they get the sex change, they realize, I don't know, six months, a year, five years later down the road, they realize, hmm, I don't think I want to be a girl anymore. I miss yep. my penis. I would like to get my right. penis back. Oh, sorry. We can't give you your penis back because it's been thrown away. Well, there's a bunch yeah. of rats eating it, a bunch of rats eating it in, in a toxic dump. So, um, yeah, the people, the kids, I should say, who are getting these sex changes, they eventually, not all of them, but a good majority of them realize down the road that they've made a mistake and the process is irreversible. Let them do it. I don't care it's anymore. Permanent. I don't care. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I care, but it, it's still just, it goes to point out how uh, parenting in our, our country, especially, has gone so much by the, I mean, you have to have a purpose in being a parent to raise a child and, and your opinion matters most to that child. And, and it's just, I guess, too many parents are like, I have to work, my husband has to work, and I'm just going to send the kids to school and they'll come home happy and I don't care. And, and that's just not the way to raise kids. And, and, and you certainly don't want your. Yet. Yeah. And, and you don't want to <laughs> like you really don't want teachers and people that get paid for a living to raise your children. Do no. You? no, no. School used to be a daycare center where you learned things. When I went to school, just like you did, we were about the same age. In fact, I think you're a year older than I am. We went to school. We went to grand. All right. Go to grammar school. I went from kindergarten to eighth grade in the same school public school number 18 in patterson new jersey i learned math i learned reading english uh back then uh social studies which is kind of like history uh of course we had gymnastics we had gym class physical uh education we had uh, i had an art class i had a home economics class um, shop, you get shop. Matter, shop, right? Uh, which yep. I learned how to do some woodworking in home. Yep. Ec, I Same learned here. how to, I learned how to bake. I learned how to sew, which to this day still serves a purpose for me as well as the carpentry that I learned. I mean, I'm not a good carpenter, but I can make things with a hammer, some nails and yeah. a lot of nails, <laughs> <There you glue>. go. <laughs> but I also learned uh, as I, some of you may know, I'm an artist. I learned art from art class in, in, in grammar school. I learned, and now, mind you, when I was in grammar school, I hated school. Okay. I'll, I'll be the first to admit it. I was like, sure, a, a, a C, I was like a C average student. The only thing I got A's in was physical, uh, you know, gym class, art, home ec of all things. Um, like I was... <laughs> They, my mother was impressed when they went to to, to pat, uh, parents' night. The home ec- uh, home economics teacher said, "She goes, she's a black woman. She could say, Michael is so good, he makes one pillow for every class I have. Now the classes were only forty five minutes. I used to bang out one, you know, like they're get they're, the teacher would say, bring in material from you know, have your mom buy material and get some stuffing. And we're gonna cut out." A square and you're going to make a pillow well while everybody was taking like two three days to make mine i was banging them. i was getting on that sewing machine <laughs> done <laughs> wow. so you know i would pass things like that today i still use i sew my own pants my own clothes um uh, everything um and we learned these things in grammar school because that's what grammar school is for nowadays i don't even know what they teach in grammar school but I hear more about them not te- – like we used to have to learn how to write. You, you know, uh, I forget what they called that class. Penmanship. Reading. Penmanship. Penmanship. Where you learn how to cursive write. Do you know people don't even know how to cursive write today? They don't even know how to read it, let they alone write. They don't even write. know how to read today, uh, Professor. I, I have met a young person, and I said something about this, and they're just like, I can't read that. And like, Seriously? <laughs> they can't even tell time, Professor Z. They can't. They can look at a clock that has hands on it, and they can't tell time. Only digital time. I remember my father teaching me how to read time. 
I remember I must have been like Me six too. or seven sitting in the living room and he took out a piece of paper and he started drawing circles and lines. And he's like, this is, you know, one o'clock. This is, you know, quarter mm-hmm. after I learned. That's that's how I learned how to understand time from my dad. That's great. Same thing. Same. Very similar. Only I was uh, forced to learn under punishment because I used to come <laughs> home late. Here's the thing. When I live late, when I how a, do I know? <laughs> when I was a little boy. I used to go out in the neighborhood and play with all my friends and it was either around the corner or up the street or around the block. But I stayed within about a two block radius of my house. Now here's the beauty of this, what I'm about to tell you. My pop, I love him. I miss him so much. My pop used to be able to whistle when he had all his teeth. (laughs) He used to be able to whistle. And I mean, when he would whistle, I could hear him too blocks away i'd be playing with my friends and i'd hear two blocks away and i'm like oh dinner time i gotta go guys and i'd run home and i i'd heard it so then there were times as i got older i'd go a little further than two blocks now i can't hear the whistle so then i come home it's like you missed dinner whack (laughs) (laughs) i'm gonna teach you how to tell time and you're when they got me a watch um so, you know, it, I learned, it, it took me a little bit, you know, but I figured it out it, it, all because of my pop. My pop helped me. And mm-hmm. uh, it's an amazing thing. You learn valuable things on how to survive and live as a, as a human being on this planet from proper parenting, as well as teaching in school, grammar school and high school, the two most important educational facilities in your lifetime grammar school and high school college is great but that's for the future that's you learning business trades and all that shit yeah that's that's for specializing in what you want to do for a living right right i heard a pundit say this uh you know a couple years ago on a radio program or something but they pointed out the fact that we put our children into the education system and the vast majority of all children go through 12 years of education and they come out as an expert in nothing. <laughs> they literally spend a dozen years learning whatever they learn, but then they come out and, you know, if they need to get a mortgage, they barely know what that is. They don't know how to ch- balance a checkbook, which has always mm-hmm. stunned me. I mean, we live in a capitalist society, but our own education systems don't teach the children how to actually be financially responsible in some manner or way. And if you're not, if your parents aren't financially responsible, then you're never going to wear, learn that s- stuff. So mm-hmm. it's just, it's stunning the fact that we spend so much time in school learning things And especially at this point, after decades and decades of our country and education system and everything like that, and and now they literally are coming out. They don't know how to read or write and and arithmetic in their heads. They have a phone. They can figure it out from the phone. The phone Mm -hmm. will tell me what time it is. The phone can tell me how to calculate. But, I mean, they're not learning it themselves. No. Or at least not a majority of them are. I'm sure there's still those students that have good parents. They're just like, you know, go there. you got to learn. They come home. They they find out what they're learning, and they, they help encourage it. So, folks, Professor Z has been to my home. And I think one of the glorious things he'll tell you about that I have in my house, aside from all the cool things I have, like skulls and bats and gargoyles. Skeletons. (laughs) And skeletons. Aside from the ones in my closet. I have on my wall a telephone plugged into a hard line with a a cord attached (laughs) to the handset. Now, it is push button. However... When my mother was alive, <laughs> she used to have one, and I'm talking, it was, it was big. It was like, like right, so maybe that wide by about that tall. Not only right. was it on the wall, hardwired to the telephone line, with a telephone handle handset with, that mm-hmm. had a cord attached to it, but here's the beauty, but it was a rotary phone, and this was like right up to 2011 <laughs> before she died. Right. A rotary phone. So she never even had a wireless phone. I mean, those were the big rage in the 90s. I got her a wireless phone, a cordless (laughs) phone. Cordless phone, that's cordless. I used to work at multiple, uh, well, I I worked at at, at a place called Crazy Eddie's when I was in my (laughs) 20s. Exactly. (laughs) 
And when I worked there, cordless phones were becoming all the rage. So yep. uh, I got one from my parents. In fact, it was mine. I, I had, and then I bought myself a new one and gave my parents one that they had never had before. And it's, um, you know, all it is, I, I showed them, I'm look. I said, look, I'll program all the numbers for you. I'll put in my number as number one, my brother's number is number two, my other brother number three, and so on and so forth. I said, all you got to do is pick it up and push the button to talk. That's it. Yes. <laughs> uh, but even that was too complicated for my mother. She hated microwaves, like even microwaves. Oh, they leak radiation. No, they don't. If they did, they no, wouldn't they sell don't. them. Yeah. But my yeah, mother exactly. Would, oh, <laughs> my mother would say, <laughs> right? My mother would say, and I would tell her, Mom, when are you going to step into the 20th century and get, mind you, that was before the 20th, first century. I would get, uh, I would say to her, when are you going to step into the 20th century and get a, 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 a push button phone? Right. I don't need one. What do you mean you don't need one? <laughs> this works fine. I'm like, yeah, it works fine. But right. if it ain't <sighs> broke, don't fix it. <laughs> that's what you, that's what happened when you dialed a rotary yep. phone. When you dialed it, like you mm-hmm. dial nine. Right. That's how it goes back. So, uh, so I told her, if you get a push button phone, all you go is. But <laughs> apparently her rotary phone was just better than any other phone. Mm-hmm. When they used to call the were... guy, when they used to call the, the phone guy over. Now, mind you, back in the day before AT&T and Sprint and all this shit that's out today, you had one phone company. Ma Bell. Bell. <laughs> yep. That's it. The telephone company was Ma Bell. And I say M A as in Ma Bell. B E L L. And yep. when you had a, a rotary telephone, which everybody had, you didn't own that phone. You rented it. So when you got your yeah. bill every month, there was a, 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 a like a rental fee. Like, you know, they only charge you a couple yep. pennies. But over years and years and years, it basically paid off the phone. And nobody got rid of their phones. They all kept their phones. The only thing they did do was get additional phones in their houses. Okay? Right. So um, what I'm trying to say is that my mom never stepped into the modern technology. She just would not accept the fact that cordless phones were good and that, oh, my God, trying to get her a, cell, a, a cellular phone, like a, 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 a – a, uh, you know, a cell phone, flip phone, right yeah. yeah. Like she had a Motorola flip phone. That was the first phones that my father had gotten for the two of them. Was like, it a razor? Oh, I don't remember. I don't remember. Okay. That's I, a really actually, flat one. Yeah, no, it was before that one. Um, anyway, I actually ended up getting it after my mom died. I, I got her phone. So my point is, um, you know, she didn't use it like everybody does today with text messaging and, whatever she just used hers to say you know call her husband like hey i'm on my way home meet me at the door to help me carry the groceries in right uh that's it that's all she used it for Mm -hmm. and uh, well but the thing as i I mentioned about the microwave not being good enough nothing was good enough she'd go to the doctor she'd go to a doctor like a, a cancer specialist and after she'd leave she'd be like that doctor don't know what he's talking about. Anybody, anybody she dealt with never knew anything like she did. She'd go to a lawyer. I see. Oh, he don't know what he don't know what he's talking about. I know what the law is. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're a housewife and have been all your life since you were eighteen, but you know the law. Okay, great. Right. She told she me. Does, she... she told me when I was twenty, uh, between the ages of twenty one. And 26. Okay, so when I started my band Empire Hideous, I was 21. Between that age period, between 21 and 26, now mind you, I was in a rock band. Nothing more, a rock band. I created all my own music, played out at original clubs, you know, did all my own stuff original. But it wasn't good enough for my mother. My mother said to me, Michael, if you want to succeed in being a musician, and a singer, you should become a wedding band. <laughs> a wedding singer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so my mother, who knew nothing about music, who had never come to see me play, was telling me, 
how to become successful as a singer. Yep. Needless to say, I didn't follow her advice. You didn't go with that. Okay. I no, understand. I didn't go with that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, your, your parents were definitely of the, the, you know, the old world mentality. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Nope. And as long as it, you know, it's still working, I'm good with it. Uh, I'm sure they never even visited Google before, you know, oh, Google. <laughs> my father would have called it like he would have called it like goggle or something. <laughs> they just, they weren't into the modern age, like electronics, kind of like how I am now with computers, how I hate them so much. <laughs> computers and cell phones and iPads. Yeah. They pass that down to you. Um, so I, I wanted to go back to actually, you, you were mentioning the cool story about the, the rotary phone. And I, I just wanted to find out I'm, I, if you ever saw this video, it, can, it was out on YouTube a few years ago, but this dad brought his two sons into a room with a rotary phone. And he said, okay, I I'm going to give you, I saw yeah, I'll give you, yeah, I'll give you five minutes to like call for pizza. And, and he gave them the number and they looked at the thing and they could not figure out how to make a phone call. And the, one of the funniest things I heard the kids say as they're trying to figure it out is they're like, they, they pick up the handset and they start dialing and they say, oh, no, no, restart. And like, that's what their term was for hanging up. They had to restart the phone by hanging it up and then pick it up again. Like, OK, now how do we do it? And in the five minutes passed and they couldn't figure out how to dial the phone. So, like, you know, I remember that stunning. video. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that's very cool. I mean, you know, your parents must have been uh, uh, very much the old world oh, type of folks that my you know, mother they, they lived through those mother. hard times. You know, not, the, not so yeah. much my father, my mother. Okay. My mother was really right. against like, oh, oh, the oven. She had an oven that they had. Uh, now, my parents had their house built in like 1950 in Patterson. Beautiful house. And um, back when Patterson was beautiful. That's right. <laughs> the house was built and the oven was the up until like, oh, my God, like 2000, maybe 2005. They had the original oven from when they had the house built. So now. Everybody has a microwave these days since they've been inv invented, right? But my mother would not use micro. She would not use a microwave. They they never bought one. There was never one in the house. They would not use them because she was convinced that they leaked radiation. Yep. <laughs> That's too funny. <laughs> so, yeah, it, she was just lacking in any trust in anybody else. Only she had the answer to everything that's right. it she I mean, trusted once nobody. or let me throw it another way. once she had something that worked that was it that was it you know it didn't she, she didn't need to do it a different way uh -huh. i mean i'm sure it's the same way you know like sort of like cooking you know this is the way i make this meal you know i i use a stove i don't i don't want to use that thing i, I have a stove you know i have to oven. this day so to this day z to this day I cannot eat anyone else's pumpkin pie because my mother, to me, made the best pumpkin pie ever. As a matter of fact, I didn't drink coffee until I was 30. And when I'd go visit my parents, like on a Sunday morning sometimes when I was married, or was I married? No, I was divorced by then. Um, I'd come over and my mother would make, like my mother would make coffee by using actual coffee grinds in a like a percolator kind of coffee oh, sure. pot. Yeah, yeah. The, the silver it, thing that had the blah, 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 blah over the would, top. Yeah. Right, would go <laughs> actually go inside the, the, the like a ceramic um, uh, coffee pot. Anywho, so okay. she'd make the coffee and I kid you not, I've drank coffee since then, but I've never had a cup of coffee like my mother made it. It was the best. And that's how I got into drinking coffee. But since then, I've never been able to reproduce the taste of the coffee that my mother made, as well as the pasta that she'd make on, on a Sunday, you know, with the, mm -hmm. with the sauce, you know, the, the, right. the, as, as us Italians call it, the gravy. Um, yeah. She'd make, you know, pasta with the meat. She'd sit there all day making these big, 
uh, uh, pots of, of, of tomato sauce with the, with the brajol and the, and the sausage and the, uh, the, the filet of, maybe not filet of mignon, but um, like steak meatballs and put a portion of that meat in the sauce to make it taste better. Oh my God. My mother to me was the best cook. And, and you, as you were saying, you become used to certain things. And I'll be the first to admit, I became very used to the things that I was growing and growing up with and led to uh, have be part of my life, whether it was something being cooked or a certain way of doing things. That's what you get when you're young. You, you learn certain things from your parents and they stay with you. Yeah, you might change them in the future and alter them like I like how I cook now. When I cook, I alter things that might be regular from some other method that my mother may have cooked or someone else. It's just that's how it is, you know. I try and you know, like anybody could ask Professor Z, how come Mike is such an idiot when it comes to the internet and computers? Because I am. I'm I'm I hate them. <laughs> And it they was a never conscious agree decision. with me. It was a conscious decision, sure. Make me look that. <laughs> but uh, uh, ultimately, I'm just no. I, t- I told Z tonight uh, we were talking. I said I have no room in my brain anymore. I have, I, 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 I have to make room in order to remember things because my head is so full of things that I've been learning since I was a child that I can't remember new things. Actually, it's just called <laughs> getting old. But um, yeah, could be my friend. It is. And I'm getting up there, boy. I'm getting up there. But you know what? I still look goddamn cool. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, but Lord it ain't like my yeah. hideous. I mean, yes. I got to look cool. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm kidding. You, you have maintained your image, my friend. <laughs> Anywho, there's a lot so. of competition out there nowadays with people who are my age because you know, they all got tattoos. They all got their piercings and everything. I'm an old man at this point. You know, I'm getting there. I'm getting way up there. And, uh, you know, I, I try to cope with what's new, new cultural things. Uh, I can't say I, I adapt with new music. Most new music sucks to me because I'm from a certain time. And having been a performer and a musician in my own band, I kind of just stick with what I knew from the 80s until the early part of 2000. It's, it's what just... you know and you love. I mean, that, right. that is, you know, the genre of music you have. And, and I don't think you're going to find very many people that are going to argue with you that, that finding good new music nowadays is very difficult to do. I mean, on, with, with uh, the advent of the internet and software and computers and all these things, we have so many people that are sitting down and, you know, making music nowadays. It's, it's almost like the streaming television scenario. Like there is so much music that you can listen to by so many varieties of people. And the same thing with the, whatever you want to watch that's visual. Like, you know, it's, it's difficult to find a place to start. So, um, you know, there is definitely a lot to be said for the, the past music because, you know, there's a lot of great bands and a lot of great musicians that have done amazing work and they're just not being overshadowed. Well, here's the other thing, too, Professor Z, is that uh, it, uh, there was a point in time when the only way you could make music is by playing an instrument. Now, since the 80s, as, as a matter of fact, uh, like the late 80s, I'm um, you know, not like from like about 86, 87 forward is when you began to get bands who eliminated drums and used a drum machine who eliminated guitars and or bass and simply did uh, programming of a bass line and a melody. And now you're at the point where it's, in many cases, one guy creating the entire song. No more instruments. There's no guy sitting there with a guitar playing chords. There's no guy sitting behind a drum kit, you know, kicking out a beat there's no guy behind a keyboard playing a a variation of rhythms and um melodies everything's done on a computer not everything but for the most part everything is being done on a computer if you recall the arc uh the um interview we did with argyle goolsby from blitzkid that was one of the questions i talked asked him about which was 
Do you prefer working in a studio where you actually sit down and your each one of your instruments is recorded, or do you prefer working in front of a computer where you sit down, plug in the guitar, and just go click, click, and you're done? So right. there's a difference well, now in making music, and I'm against it because I, when I started my band, a I had no idea how to write a song. B, I had never sang a song in my life. C, I had never written a song in my life. And right. I, I had I had two older brothers, I still do, who were musicians. My second oldest brother, Steve, uh, learned piano. Uh, he wanted to be a music uh, a, a conductor, a music major. So he studied all types of classical instruments, violin, cello, flute, piano, but he was primarily a pianist, okay? My, my oldest brother, Frank, he was into rock and roll. He played guitar. In fact, his first instrument was drums. Then he played guitar, and that was his instrument thereafter. Um, but, you know, I got the best of both worlds. I got the best of classical music from my brother Steve, rock and roll from my brother Frank, my oldest brother. And for me, I incorporated the best of the both of them, or I should say what inspired them, and then I created my own style of music and my own band. But again, I never learned right. I never learned anything about music until I actually picked up an instrument and began writing tunes. Not you know, in my experience, especially, I find it so important to actually know the foundations of mm -hmm. a particular field, the origins of a particular field, or, or, you know, how how music is written. You know, all those those things are so important. And like you were saying, with programming and computer programs, you can kind of skip over that stuff. You know, you could open up GarageBand and, and start just literally pressing buttons and make something that sounds good, but it doesn't necessarily mean you understand the fundamentals about mm -hmm. writing music and, and lyrics is right. certainly, I think a possibly a tougher thing to engage in rather than just the, the music itself. Cause finding the right words that go with the That's music right. is, is gotta be a daunting task depending on your skill set and, and what your, your creative abilities That's are. That's one of the reasons I absolutely despise rap music um, when I listen to the lyrics, if you want to call them lyrics, to the words uh, that they're emitting from their mouth, I don't even consider it singing. Okay, rapping to me is talentless music. What they do is they'll use a word like rapper, R-A-P-P-A, rapper, and they'll rhyme it with snapper. You're a rapper and you're a snapper. I mean, that's just, that's childish. Um, even it is some, in a way because you're just making up words. Exactly. My point, there's no, there's no depth to my, in my opinion, to a rap song. I could write rap music with a pen in my butt and I could write down an entire rap song. That's how little talent it takes to create rap music. OK, rap music has cannot hold like, yeah, it's funny because I'm sitting here bad mouthing rap when it's the top listened to music in this country. Is it now you've you've you know that? Oh, you just, no, just I mean, saying. it's certainly one of the most popular ones. <laughs> and, and yes, That's there you go. Point. That's okay. what I was trying to say. It's it's one of the most popular styles of music that we listen to. Now, there was a point in time in the mid 80s. When I was still just, you know, really, really getting into music and understanding. But at the time, I was becoming aware of things. And I believe it was in 1980, don't quote me on this, I want to say 82, 81 maybe, when Run DMC came out. And when Run DMC came out, even though there, like, there were only two types of music, well, three, but you either had rock and roll or disco. That's right, disco. And then eventually you had the kids who liked rock and roll who all hung out together. And then you had the kids who liked rap and before that disco. And eventually both rap and rock and roll branched off into all these other categories, 
Now, I can only speak for rock and roll when I talk about the categories that came out. So in rock and roll, you had punk rock. You had uh, classic rock. You had heavy metal. You had industrial. You had black metal. You had death metal. All these different genres of rock and roll came out. In rap, you had hip-hop. You had, I don't even know. I think there's just rap and hip-hop. I don't know. This goes to show you how much I really care about rap music. (laughs) <laughs> um, all I'm saying is that you had, you had at one point you had two styles of rap of music, rock and roll and disco, and then it changed into so many different other things. Uh, but I, what I'm trying to say is in the mid eighties, I actually supported rap because I was for like, all right, well, the black culture had been suppressed for so long. This is their way of getting it out. So, and I believed back in the mid eighties that, that the rap, that was being produced music that was being produced was a cultural thing for the black community to express their anger and feelings. Now, just like I was a young kid and a young 19 year old punk rocker, that was the same for me. I got into a, my first punk rock band was a, was a band called angry corpse or angry corpses uh, with this guy, Kenny Ballone, who played guitar and ended up playing for Billy Milano in uh, MOD, Method of Destruction, MOD. He, on the first record, Kenny Ballone is the one who wrote and, and did some of the music on MOD's album. So my first punk rock band, hardcore punk rock band, was Angry Corpses with Kenny Ballone. He's, by the way, he's dead now. Um, so my expression was anger because that's what punk rock was it was an anger at the establishment and anger at religion politics anybody who pissed you off it was an anger against rock and roll like we were tired of hearing led zeppelin and rod stewart and uh leonard skinner all our lives we wanted something new so you had the sex pistols that came out you had the ramones the damn the clash these were aggressive types of music that helped us say hey we're tired of listening to Eric Clapton, Eric Clapton's song about cocaine. We want to hear different music. And that's how it evolved. The opinions and ideas expressed during this podcast belong to the speakers and are not a reflection on the services used to distribute this podcast. Listener and viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, listening to Finding the Truth with Mike Hideous. That's me, Mike Hideous. I am your host, my co-host, my producer, my engineer, the other guy, Professor Z. And that is I. How we're going to end off the show. It's called Did You Know? And basically, we just, did you know, such and such, blah, blah, blah. And uh, tonight, Professor Z is going to start off by hitting me with a did you know? Uh, you, you do know who, um, are you familiar with Kate Middleton? Have you heard that name? I know that name. It sounds familiar. Well, she's a royal. She married um, Prince uh, William, you know, who is Prince or King Charles's son. So is that, th- hmm? that's not the people who left the. No, that's Morgan. Ma- Ma- Morgan. Of- Mar- I'm still saying her name. Margo. Maybe. Anyway, that's Harry. He's the guy who's obviously you know Harry. pussy whipped by gotcha. his girlfriend okay. and decided to give up uh, the life right. of a royal. In either case, no. This is what a moron. This is Kate Middleton, and <laughs> and she's whatever controversy, but it's just kind of interesting. There's a story today pointing out the fact that uh, apparently she likes to use Photoshop, and so recently she she put out a picture because in in England Sunday was Mother's Day, 
and <laughs> she put out a picture of her and her three kids uh, for you know to put on social media, and she actually okay. edited the image in Photoshop, manipulated it. And so it got published around the world. But then the Associated Press looked at it closely and determined that it was manipulated and took it off. <laughs> okay. And, and I did, she didn't actually specify what she did, but she actually came clean about it. So it was kind of humorous. After her Mother's Day photo shared on social media was pulled from news agencies amid allegations of manipulation, Middleton stressed the issue head on on Monday. Writing in the official Palace social media pages, she said, like many amateur photographers, I do occasionally experiment with editing. I wanted to express my apologies for any confusion of the family photo was shared yesterday cause. So it's just, you know, this woman just tried to make a nice picture of her family. And literally the, the mass media is like, oh, no, that's not right. You know, and they can't have that. And like, but uh, I'm surprised because even in the business that... Uh... I've been in with photography and those who I know who are in it. Um, the editing process is always, uh, yes, you do. You don't manipulate the subject per se, but you can enhance things. Usually the only times I know that editors use uh, or, or take things a little bit more drastically and do editing is when there's say, oh, I want to know maybe, um, I don't know, something might, something small might get in the way of the face. Or I've even seen uh, editors who have been able to fix people's eyes when they, they blink and they're closed and they'll fix it so that their eyes are actually open. Uh, so you got to be really good in order to do that, which I'm not that good. But um, I've seen it. I've seen it done by some, some people. Anywho, I didn't know either, but uh, interesting story nonetheless. So, I've got one for you. So did you know that AI, artificial intelligence, is now currently making um, what they're referring to as, quote, perfect, a perfect woman, unquote. Um, and that's obviously for men or women, depending on which side of the fence you sit or. On you make an way. interesting point. I wonder if there is virtual men, in, you know. Uh, social influencers, but go ahead. Oh, I think there is. I think there is because I, then again, you know what? I shouldn't say that because there is a possibility that uh, the, 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 the male uh, homosexual culture, they don't need, <laughs> they don't need it because <laughs> they just find their own other guys who are gay. Okay. What do you need a doll for? <laughs> Anywho, so AI apparently is uh, creating this "quote unquote" perfect woman for men to pleasure themselves to, which means that in the future, possibly the very near f future, hookers are going to be up for some serious competition if they even have a job come you know <laughs> down the line, so to speak. And I don't mean any particular kind of job to get my drift. No. So there's that. And so along with many other jobs that humans may now lose uh, their jobs, I mean, as a result due to AI, there are so many things that AI is now going to be able to do. And again, I know you're going to tell me, well, it's, it's, it's programmed by people. I get that. But AI is now going to be capable of the possibility of handling job functions that were once handled by humans, uh, like just like assembly line work. Mm -hmm. But here, and you know what? I'm okay with the assembly line work. However, now you're talking about creating a perfect woman or let's just say a perfect woman and a possibly a perfect man for whomever, for whatever. Usually it's for the, you know, pleasuring stuff. 
Right. So, and that's um, to say that's where it's still got to be mostly females because guys could go nuts over a virtual girl, but I don't see girls going nuts over virtual guys. And again, I don't think it would be even for guys. I think it would be, I'm sorry, I don't even think it would be for girls. I think it would be for other guys. Well, maybe, but. Oh, you know, come on. You know, like you're just pointing out, I mean, people get, I think it may be a specifically scenario for male and female and, you know, guys chasing girls type of thing. I actually did a quick uh, search on this to, find if there was any sort of listing of virtual uh, models or in- influencers. And interestingly enough, I came up with uh, basically a list of 20 individual or 20 virtual people. And the one on the top of the list is somebody who is called, I think she's from Asia, Lou. Lou of magazine Luza. I, I don't know what it is, but in either case, she has 5.8 million followers. We have a there's <laughs> yep. And, and here we got uh, little Miguel, maybe Miguela, and she's got uh, 3.1 million followers. Mm. So that's where I'm going to have to say, I'm pretty sure most of those followers are guys. Mm-hmm. <laughs> maybe there's some girls in there that enjoy it as well. But I just can't imagine like guys might be able to enjoy a virtual relationship, but I don't think girls do too much. Listen, um, you and I have had this conversation before that i'm about to bring up which is i've told you i scan youtube and i look for interesting things to watch while i'm sitting down either eating my breakfast lunch dinner or whatever or sitting on the porcelain throne and um (laughs) what i'll do is i'll look through the variety of youtube podcasts or clips or whatever and I try to find something that's interesting. So a lot of times I'll come across a podcast uh, operator who has a show. And basically what the person is doing is reviewing another person's podcast. Right. Now, they'll make an entire show out of it. 30 minutes for 15, 30, 45 minutes, whatever. They're making an entire show of their opinion based on another person's podcast who the person that they're reviewing is talking about something legitimate, talking about, let's just say for hypothetical uh, purposes, the, the, the podcast is about President Biden or the the court cases with president trump and the person who's reviewing the intellect podcast more times than not doesn't know who they're talking about has no idea doesn't do their homework about the person they are interviewing uh, i'm sorry that they're reviewing they don't um know some of the topics of the intellectual person who's doing the podcast and and like they in in many cases they can barely speak english now look i'll be the first to admit i am not articulate i'm not a very articulate person and i'm very bad at speaking especially in public so even when i had to do this podcast this was a difficult thing for me because i'm not a speaker i'm a performer and a singer put me in front of a hundred thousand people i'll rock their socks off put me on a pat podcast where I got a talk. See, even there I stumbled. I, I can never quite get out the words that I want to. My point is this. I'm the first to admit that I've got issues when it comes to speaking publicly or in a podcast, but these other people, they don't even know how to speak. They don't even know how to use proper words. Mm-hmm. They either can't but yet they're getting it. so many thousands of views and followers. Tens, thousand, twenty thousand people follow them. Mm-hmm. It, like, like I can't believe it. And here we are. We're trying to provide an intellectual show that offers a, a variety of topics, from politics to to uh, art to music to 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 uh, authors who've written books and 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 you know. Uh, like we were talking about before the eclipse and photography and videography. And yet we have a hundred followers. <laughs> <laughs> Granted, we just started. I get yeah, it. We're and still I, in our infancy. We need to have right. some time under our belt. 
and I hope that it would get, I'd, I'd be happy with like maybe 5,000 people. I'd be happy with that, knowing that I could provide it, a, a, an interesting show and with topics to them. But for me to watch these other people who are completely, uh, what would the proper word be, inarticulate? You got these folks that just know how to put things together to try and just get, reach the objective of being uh, monetized. And, you know, they're not looking to, sorry that I'm going to use this word again, they're not looking to be objective. Their objective is just to, you know, eventually start cashing in on whatever they're creating. And that's where content creation is obviously, you know, an, a legitimate business nowadays. But there is so much content being created. And like you were starting out in the beginning with virtual people, you know, it's just amazing how many people take the time to follow and like and share and stuff that is not necessarily grounded in anything that is truthful or that's realistic right. or, you know, anything that's that's really pertinent to real everyday life. So it's it's discouraging when I when I see people who live in this country and are trying to do a show much like what we're trying to do here yet they can't use the proper words they don't know and again I'm not tooting my own horn because I know I got my own issues here when it comes to speaking and understanding certain things I stumble a lot I admit it but at least I'm making an effort I'm not a stupid person. I just, I'm not articulate, but I'm, and I hate to brag, but I've read a lot of books and I've read about a lot of topics and I've become intelligent in my own way about certain topics and issues and subjects. But these people seem to have failed high school. And and like we were talking about before with the education system, you spend 12 years and you come out really not knowledgeable or expert in anything. But uh, I guess I'd like to throw out this because uh, it's, it's an app sort of principle at the very least to point out that, um, you know, the difference between knowledge and wisdom is experience. Yeah. You can't get wisdom without experience. Yep. You have to have the time to get the experience. So you can be very knowledgeable at a young age, but it's not going to be that helpful unless you have some experience. And then maybe someday you'll be wise, you yeah, know, if you're lucky. Very few. I think there are very few people on that line of becoming wise in the future, because I sincerely believe there are a lot of problems with the younger generation of this country. And they are they're going to find that out when they realize they don't have the education that they need and that just knowing how to push a few buttons on a cell phone. is going to make you popular, popular, successful or rich. That, that's nope. what blows my mind is how some of these people are getting away with it. And they don't they don't know how many important things it is there are to learn in grammar school and high school, such as carpentry, plumbing, sure. uh, electronics, um, uh, um, stuff. What are they? Uh, a, a, a air conditioning, a, a heating units. Yeah. The HVAC sort of stuff and stuff. Right. Yeah. I mean, um, these are trades and little by little trades, you know, like like shoemakers are, are becoming more and more difficult to find. Oh, sure. Why? Because when people no longer when their shoes might have a hole in the sole, what do they do, they throw them out. They buy a new pair. Well, yeah, it, there's a many. But going back to your other point, there's many other really uh, important skills. You know, shoes is one thing, obviously, with mass manufacturing. You know, nowadays, you, hell, you can get a 3D printer to make you a shoe. But um, the thing no, is that I don't want to wear that shoe. <laughs> well, you'd be surprised, honestly. They're, they're, the machines are, are producing some amazing things with amazing materials. But um, what I was going to say is, is my experience when I was working as, a, as an actual adjunct professor uh, for a community college Um one of the big things the college was pushing was the fact that they had a welding program. And they stressed the fact that nationally, we are short on welders. Mm-hmm. We don't have enough welders in this world to fill how much we have for a need. Mm-hmm. And that can be a huge, incredibly well-paying job. That's right. But there's no incentive for people to want to become a welder necessarily. 50 to $100 an hour, depending on the job. I didn't pay attention in school. I nearly quit high school when I was 16 and failed my sophomore year. No, I'm sorry, junior year. Um, yeah, I almost quit and almost joined the Navy. 
simply to impress my father. Thank that would have been a different scenario. Oh yeah, especially due to the fact that I'm petrified of water and I wanted to join the <laughs> navy. I wanted to join the navy. Wow, that you that's know, my, rough, dude. <laughs> it is. My father was in the navy, and uh, you know he served in uh, the Korean War. Um, and I remember it was junior year, the beginning of junior year. And I think in, uh, maybe November they send out, if you're not doing well in the first semester, they send you, um, they send your parents a warning notice. Right. I remember those days. And I thought I was doing great. And this was English class. I thought I was doing great. Let me tell you, man, there were kids in my class. I went to John F. Kennedy High School. Oh, my God. So it's a war zone now. But when I went, there were kids in that class. This this little teacher, this little lady, little little woman with a very quiet voice trying to teach these rowdy kids. I I used to sit there and give her respect. I never got out of hand in high school or grammar school for that matter. But I would try to listen to her, and I tried and tried and tried to do my very best in school. That first semester, I got a warning notice, and I was so upset, I went right, I went right to the principal's office, and I said, give me the paperwork to quit school. I said, I'm quitting. I can't take this anymore. I really thought I was stupid. I really thought I was completely stupid. And I was going to join the Navy. In fact, I went home that night, showed my, my parents the paperwork i said i've tried and i've tried and here again i'm failing i'm i'm not intelligent i i i can i can draw i can paint but i can't i don't know about history i don't know about i can't do mathematics uh i was just a failure but uh, so i was so upset i said i'm going to join the navy I had my father drive me down to the recruiting office like the next day at eight. I was going to have my parents sign for me to go into the Navy because you obviously got to be 18. But if you have your parents' signature, you can join at 16. That's what, excuse me, that's what I was going to do. Thank goodness I didn't do it because I am definitely afraid of water. And I've seen the things that the, that the Navy uh, sailors do, and I would not want to be a sailor. Okay, folks, so here's the deal. Where's my paperwork? So um, we have another interview that's going to be coming up. Um, uh, I'm going to be interviewing uh, two members of a band called October Noor um, from Florida. Um, We are going to be interviewing the uh, lead singer slash bass player and the entrepreneur of the band. Uh, his name is Ta- um, his name is Tom Noor, uh, N O I R, and we're going to also be interviewing the drummer for the band named Tyler Fleming, and they're going to be coming on the show on the 18th to be recorded, and then we'll be editing that show and releasing it the following week. Uh, so they're going to be coming on, and um, looking forward to that interview. This is a band. If you get an opportunity, to look up October Noor. N O I R. They, if you like typo negative, check out October Noor. You will be greatly impressed. They are not only great, a great band that writes great material, but the um, the sound that they that they give off as a band is very much in the very much in the veins of typo negative um you and they've got videos out they've got cds out you can get um all of which will be talked about uh, when i do the interview on the 18th and then obviously the next week the show will be released so uh yeah in the meantime if you want to look them up they've got videos out they've got music out that you can buy i'm assuming if you look up their name you'll get their their uh uh website i'm pleased to say that this uh episode has come to an end Uh, we've i think it was quite fascinating from the beginning to the end um very much thank yous to um my co-host my producer and my partner in crime professor z 
couldn't do this show without you, man. Uh, well, you're very welcome. It's a pleasure to be a part of the show. And, uh, and honestly, this is just a, a lot of fun, Mike. I mean, you and I have great conversations all the time. So it's, it's really awesome to be able to record these and share them. And hopefully our, our listeners will, you know, like, share, and subscribe. And, and we're going to try to do shows like, like each month, we're going to try to do like maybe two interviews of different people during the month without exceeding too many interviews i still want to be able to do the show with professor z where we have these uh, uh these you know intimate conversations about topics no matter what they may be but on the other hand i do enjoy getting somebody in here that we don't know uh, i shouldn't say that uh, that we don't that we wouldn't normally uh, uh talk about or or that you might know um so i have a a, a bunch of people that i'm going to ask to be coming on the show in future episodes to come. Uh, but in the meantime, all that aside, we had a great night and, and, and uh, I sincerely hope that you will subscribe, like, and share these episodes with people. We would uh, greatly appreciate that. And again, if you like the show, or even if you don't like it, Write to us. Let us know what you think, because maybe we can offer something different that you might know that we can we can do the show for. So, um, yeah, write to us. Let us know. So you may have, if you've heard the episode ten, you may have heard that the song that we used at the end of the show was different. Um, here's the deal: for any of you who are interested, the songs that are being used on this podcast are songs that i've written uh the first song is a song called uh uh, dance dance dead rhythms and that is a track from my last studio recorded album uh by empire hideous technically it was just me so it it says the empire hideous featuring mike hideous it was just me uh anyway so you can uh hear that track in its entirety with vocals on the album the time has come again you can get this on mikehideous.com now we ended the song last week i'm sorry we ended the (laughs) we ended the episode last week with another song from the same album called alone and uh again these these songs can be either downloaded or bought physical cd on mikehideous.com um that that music is written uh by myself um uh when was that released 2011 i believe uh as a matter of fact peter Steele from typo negative was supposed to produce that album but literally died while doing pre-production on the album just a little a little uh well, if you read my book out there, folks, you will know the story of Pete Steele from Typo Negative and me and my final album, the songs you're hearing that we're playing on Finding the Truth of Mike Hideous. He was supposed to, supposed to produce that album. If you're interested, go to MikeHideous.com and you can get not only these tracks, but other songs and tracks that I have recorded in the past. And on that note, we're going to end the show. And the last song you'll be hearing tonight is called Alone, written by yours truly from the album, The Time Has Come. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Thank you for listening. And we'll see you next time on Finding the Truth with Mike Hideous.